Hello, everyone. It is an honor to be joining you today to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Uh, my name is Creighton, and I'm a member of Chao Collective, and today I would like to address and challenge the prevailing attitude of the Western left towards the People's Republic of China, beginning with a short reflection on my time in the country in 2019. Five years ago, I was fortunate enough to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the PRC from inside the country. It was a bittersweet occasion, marking the year that the PRC surpassed the USSR in longevity. This milestone represented the endurance of China's revolutionary process and the stability of the world's largest socialist state. It also served as a reminder that the more empowered socialist China becomes, the more US imperial aggression against it intensifies. In the same year, China weathered a color revolution attempt in Hong Kong and a media blitz on Xinjiang. Two months later, the discovery of the novel coronavirus would unleash a new wave of xenophobic propaganda and plunge the world into crisis. In, two, in 2019, what brought me back to my country of origin was a desire to understand China from a Chinese perspective. During my undergraduate studies, I realized that the radical theories and anti-capitalist politics I had been exposed to were wholly inadequate to properly analyze and appreciate the PRC, although I did not yet understand why this was the case. After becoming disillusioned with my Western liberal arts education, I became increasingly convinced of the validity of Marxism-Leninism and the sincerity of the Communist Party of China. The process of re-educating myself called my entire educational history into question, and in particular, opened my eyes to the distortions of Marxism that have contributed to the Western left's ahistorical and undialectical analyses of China. One of the best resources that anti-imperialists can use to understand this phenomenon is the book Western Marxism by the late Domenico Lasordo. It traces the bifurcation of Marxism into Western and Eastern forms and highlights the need for Western Marxism to rediscover the revolutionary core of dialectical materialism and be rejuvenated as an anti-imperialist practice. The Western Marxism that Lasorda speaks of is not merely a geographic category, but refers to the commodified chauvinist and accommodationist form that is marketed by the academic presses and intellectuals of the imperial core as the best inheritor of the Marxist tradition. Whereas Western Marxism is largely confined to, West, uh, to academic critique and characterized by its defeatism, utopianism, and anti-communism, Eastern Marxism, on the other hand, found practical application in the anti-colonial revolutions of the 20th century and is still being advanced by the social states of today. Um, I would like to read a short excerpt from the Appendix of Western Marxism, summarizing the main points of the book. In the West, Marxism was schooled primarily in condemning the destructive consequences of inter-imperialist rivalry and war, while in the East, the October Revolution found an extraordinary echo, thanks to the call to the, quote, slaves in the colonies, unquote, to break the chains of oppression and national humiliation. In the West, the nation state was the bloodthirsty Moloch that sacrificed millions of people to the greed for power in the interests of big business. In the East, it was a question of shaking off the colonial yoke and putting an end to the genocidal and enslaving practices used by the great capitalist powers against the quote, barbarians, unquote. In the two zones into which the world was divided, imperialism was experienced in different ways. There is no contradiction, but rather a full convergence between these two aspects. But have Western and Eastern Marxism ever met? Has the first ever really grasped the second? Since the initial difficulties and tragedies of the system that emerged from the October Revolution became apparent, but especially since the crisis of, quote, real socialism, unquote, became clear, the split between Eastern and Western Marxists has led to the fact that Marxists in power and Marxists in opposition, the latter increasingly focusing on critical theory, deconstruction, and also the condemnation of power and of power relations in general, are alien to each other. And so Western Marxism was born, which increasingly understood its distance from power as a favorable condition for the rediscovery of a, a, a quote, authentic Marxism, 
unquote, that was no longer reduced to a, quote, state ideology, unquote. Um, in the West, in Western left discourse, it is not uncommon to hear arguments that China is imperialist, that China has betrayed its revolution and restored capitalism, that it has turned its back on the global South, etc. Western Marxists have built entire careers criticizing actually existing socialism, demonizing it as authoritarian, campus, status, etc., while sowing confusion about actually existing imperialism. These are fundamental misapprehensions of China in the world we live in. In the imperial core, solidarity with China is an embattled position against the Western left intelligentsia's reflexive anti-communism, rejection of the national question, and anti-materialist conceptions of imperialism. Marxists supportive of China are put in a defensive position from the start. These are the terms of discourse that bourgeois institutions have set for us and that we must refuse if an anti-imperialist Marxism is to develop in the West. In Western Marxism, Lesordo observed that the, the quote, war that the United States is preparing for is against China, the country born of the greatest anti-colonial revolution in history and directed by an experienced communist party, unquote. As the PRC enters its 75th year of struggle under intensifying imperialist aggression, there should be no doubts on the left about China's role as a world historical progressive force, its socialist character, or the positive relationship between Chinese sovereign development and the growth of its capacity for people's war. Additionally, we must understand the Western Marxist disavowal of actually existing socialism as a class position and not just the product of propaganda or ignorance. When I look back on my experiences during Golden Week in China in 2019, I think of the ideological freedom and inspiration I found in China. Outside of the suffocating atmosphere of the US, I did not have to censor myself or preface discussion of China with critique or dilute my enthusiasm for Chinese socialism. Uh, for that reason, I would like to express my gratitude to the Friends of Socialist China for organizing today's event which has afforded me the same discursive freedom I enjoyed in China, and for, for convening this group of panelists who share a commitment to reigniting anti-imperialist Marxism in solidarity with the PRC. Thank you.